Hello and welcome to MMA Crips Fighting Talk. For today's show, we'll be going five rounds of recent hot MMA news featuring GSP and USC on Fox 9. Okay, joining me today will be Mr. Greg Marshall and Brian Hunt. Okay, let's start the show with round one and GSP vacates his welterweight title. During our media slash conference call on December 13th, 2013, GSP announced he would be vacating his title to take a break from the sport. I think we sort of felt this was coming, even though it seemed Dana White was trying to whip the GSP versus Hendricks 2 angle and downplayed a lot of GSP's concerns. Uh, what's your thoughts on this, Brian? And did you ever think GSP would vacate the title? No. I was with Dana on this one, and I, God, I hate saying that sometimes, but I didn't. I thought he would just he'd get away from it, clear his head a little bit, and and then be all right. And so... Uh, this one caught me off, not off guard, because there were several signs, but if I had to pick one or the other, uh, I would thought he was going to come back. And he'd say, no, I'm, I'm ready to start a camp in a couple of months, and then I'll, I'll beat Hendricks again type of thing. So um, it did catch me off guard. Uh, Greg, did you ever think he would vacate the title like he did? I'm the opposite. I, I'm surprised he, he only announced that it was going to be a break. I was expecting complete retirement. It's been rumoured for far too long now. And the way he was after that fight, with that speech, it seemed to me that he was going to call it a day. And Dana pushing him to have the rematch, I thought, would have forced him even more into calling retirement. So I was a little surprised it was only a break, so to speak, but not not surprised about the announcement too much. So you think Dana White's not been helping matters since uh, GSP made his post-fight speech? I think he probably has since then a little because he backed off a lot but I think yeah. um, initially I don't think that would have went down well well Brian GSP hasn't conceded that he is in retirement but I want to sort of look <laughs> at the facts here he has achieved a lot in the sport he's made enough money to retire but he is still young in terms of MMA you know he's only 32 years of age do you see GSP returning Brian or do you think this will turn into a full retirement much like Greg said I see him returning. Uh, these these competitors in these sports, the individual sports, they're a different breed. Uh, they, they they desire that competition. They really, really do. And most professional athletes don't leave when they want to. They leave when they're forced to. GSP still has plenty of game. And I think he's going to sit back, get fat, get like me a little bit, and relax, and then decide, okay, I'm kind of bored. And there's so much, so much time on a be- uh, beach that guys like this can take. He's going to want the competition. He's going to get that that itch again. What, what Dana keeps saying is, if you don't have it in your heart, don't fight. And right now he doesn't. And I think Silva, Anderson Silva, was the same way after that fight. If you take Silva's reaction to the loss versus GSP's reaction to the win, they were very similar. They're a very similar type of, uh, I'm just not feeling it. I, I think the pressure of being champ is so much greater than any of us can really comprehend. And I think that beat up GSP, and I think it beat up Silver, too. So I do expect him back. Maybe nine months, six months, nine months, somewhere down the road. Uh, I, I can see him coming back for sure. Brian, you mentioned you was fat. I thought you had a six-pack. Uh, that in the refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry to mislead you guys. <laughs> well, the division does go on, you know, and Zuffer wasted no time in scheduling plans for the next two challengers um, competing for their vacant wallet strap at UFC 171 will be Mr. Johnny Hendricks and ruthless Robbie Lawler. Uh, what's your thoughts on this bout to crown the new welterweight champion, Brian? Are these the correct uh, two guys who should be fighting for that title? I, I like it. Um... I think Lawler moved up fairly fast to really be getting a strap, a title at the strap. Um, I, I kind of like maybe a little four, four-way four mini tournament to get the belts uh, with those two being part of it. And the, oh, the winner of maybe Shields versus Hector uh, being part of it. And who would be the fourth guy? Crap, Condit. I know I'm missing some. Condit. There you go. Condit would be the fourth guy. I like a little four-way tourney uh, with, with those guys. And then the winner of that gets it. So I'd be good with that. I like that. But I think um, um, Hector Lombardi is not in the top 10. And he is from American top team. 
the same as Robbie Lawler, so that could be a problem there. But who was the other guys? Carlos Condit, sorry, I like that. Johnny Hendricks, um, Damian Meyer, and Jake Shields. I won't even put Robbie Lawler in. But if you look from Jake Shields up, it's Jake Shields, Damian Meyer, Jake Ellenberger, Roy McDonald, Robbie Lawler, Carlos Condit, and Johnny Hendricks. Like you mentioned, Robbie Lawler, he's he's always come back. You know, we'll see on three solid wins now. So for me, I just think he needs to do just a little bit more. You know, one more win for me before he gets the title shot. I think Jake Shields has done so much more. You know, he's he has got the boys star like you mentioned. You know, I don't really want to go into Jake Shields with you there, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good part. But um, you know, he's coming off wins over Damian Meyer and Tyron Woodley and Yoshio Akiyama. I really think that they're three better opponents than what Robbie Lawler beat. So that's how I'd go. Greg, do you think these are the correct two guys fighting for the title? Uh, yes and no. Um, I'm kind of with you and Lawler. I kind of feel he should have another win as well. But he just beat Rory McDonald, who is widely considered the next best behind GSP and Hendricks. Um, if beating the number three guy in the division doesn't get you a title shot, then you've got problems. Uh, Lawler deserves it on that basis alone. Um, only other guy I would say that deserves it ahead of Lawler is uh, Condit. Nobody else. Jake Shields has beat some good guys, but he's not beat um, Rory McDonald. Lawler's done everything he had to do. Um, and again, I don't really think he should be there yet, but it's hard to argue against it. I think Danny White's uh, Robbie Lawler not a guy, to be honest with you. I think he's a massive fan of his, and that's what's helped with the push for the title. But then he's won three fights convincingly. Um, well, not convincingly, the first two, but... Yeah, I'll say what you like, Greg. I know he's I know he's a nutter guy, uh, Robbie Lawler. All right. That's, that's enough for me. <laughs> um, but I, I, I would have liked a, a, a little tournament as well, but I think Dana... Yeah. If we're looking at it and they're expecting GSP back, the tournament wouldn't be finished before GSP comes back, probably. That's the only issue with that. Well, it seems like we're all agreed on the tournament. Definitely UFC should have gone that way. Hopefully you listeners uh, post your comments below and let us know what you think about the tournament. If you would like to see a four-man tournament and who you would like to see in that four-man tournament, hopefully. Okay, before we move on to round two, I'd like to welcome in Sugar Pooper, a.k.a. Gregory Sanchez. Uh, many viewers will remember Greg from previous episodes of MMA Crips Fighting Talk. Say hello to the viewers there, Greg. Hey, thanks for having me on, guys. No worries there, Gregory. Okay, moving on to round two. Edson Barbosa versus Danny Castillo. Now, I did say this fight should have been on the main card, if you guys remember. I feel like the fight itself cemented my comments. Uh, did that fight prove it should have been a main card fight, in your opinion there, Brian? Um, depending on the format. If it was pay-per-view, I would say yes, because the guys get a percentage cut, or some of them get a percentage cut, they get more... Uh, more, I think, money for their sponsorships, and it was, it was definitely worthy, but being it was just Fox 1 versus Fox, it, it didn't upset me as much, because the same people that were going to watch the Fox card most likely watched the Fox 1 card, so it didn't, I wasn't so butthurt about it, but uh, yeah, I think 9 times out of 10, that's, well, Bob Boza should be a, probably the main card guy all the time, so. Greg, did it prove main card material to you? Well, the fact that it was fight of the night and everybody seemed to consider that it would possibly be fight of the night kind of suggests it should have been on there. Um, the fact and also that Lozon and Danzig were both coming off of two losses. It seems a bit strange having a couple of guys on the main card that are both coming off two losses. Although everyone knows Lozon always puts on exciting fights, which is probably the main reason he was there. Well, any of you off a brass, you know, if you ever want to bring us on as, um, you know, matchmakers, it's, it's no problem at all. Just give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Sanchez, welcome to the show. And did you think the fight cemented itself as a main card fight? Obviously, you just said what Greg had to say and what Brian had to say. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking how Blue's thinking in, like, that Dana White and Joe Silva, they probably bumped, it, bumped up uh, Lozon just for the fact that he's so exciting. Because, yeah, definitely, Castillo and Barboza, you you could have easily put them on the first fight in the main card and it would have been okay. Do you think that actually outmatched 
every single fight on the main card, uh, Gregory. Oh yeah, this this is the only fight on the card that I was screaming the whole time. My mom thought I was being crazy, but it was just amazing back and forth. Like uh, it was just an amazing fight all around. Uh, yeah, because if we look at the card last night, um, there was Joel Olson versus Matt Danzig, Chad Mendes versus Nick Lentz. Uriah Faber versus Michael McDonald and Demetrius Johnson versus Joseph Benavides. Now, the two main and core main event fights, you know, they ended with quick finishes. But before that, there was sort of like pretty, I wouldn't say dull affairs, you know, because it certainly wasn't dull affairs, but there was um, mediocre in a way, you know, nothing spectacular. Chad Mendes versus Nick Lentz, obviously, Chad Mendes was carrying a flu of some sort, you know, that didn't help his performance. He sort of just laid there instead of his usual vicious ground and pound. Then Lawson obviously, well, I wouldn't say schooled, but it was certainly outclassed Mac Danzig, but it was no thriller. So to me, the Barbells of Castillo fight was better than any of those fights on the card. Would you agree with that too there, Greg? I, I think it uh, definitely overshadowed them both, but um, no way it should have been ahead of Mendes Lentz, for example. That was pretty much a number one contender's fight in that, in that. Uh, weight class that well, definitely should have been main card status um, as, as for Lozo and Danzig like I said already I think it's basically been put there on the the fact that Lozo always puts on exciting fights and as for school and Danzig I disagree <laughs> why is that there Greg? I thought Danzig was schooling him on the feet and yeah? Lozo only won the fight because Danzig was silly enough to take the fight to the ground a couple of times. I thought once he got him down to the ground, you know, he, he worked past his guard pretty easy in, in half oh, guard. Yeah. And there wasn't Wait, a lot Danzig could do. So it's like, it's really weird because Danzig's normally good on the ground. And just the way, you know, Lawson handled him there. It, it, I expected more of a close fight. That's why I sort of say that. You know, I might be a bit, you know, at line saying schooled there, you know. But I just didn't expect it. was On paper, it was much more closer. Like um, sort of mirror image fight. Yeah. Well, obviously, Lawson was just a bit more aggressive, she would say. Yeah. And Danzig's more tactical. Yeah, let's see. once the fight did go to the ground, Lawson definitely held the advantage. Um, but I think there was a, at least three times in the fight that Danzig instigated the move to take the fight to the ground. Whereas if when he was standing, he was picking Lawson off easily. I thought uh, if Danzig had kept the fight standing, he would have won that fight easily. But. Well, in any event, Barbells had uh, the decision victory. There was one judge who scored about a draw and round one at 10 8 round for Castillo. And the other two rounds, 10 9 for Barbells. Uh. Now, the other two judges gave Castillo round one, 10 9, and the uh, fight 29 28. Barbells uh, awarded him the victory, obviously. Pretty much all the comments from the MMA Crip members last night on the in play were expecting a draw. Brian, how did you score that first round and the fight between Edson Barbosa and Danny Castillo last night? Do you think it should have been a draw? It's a draw. I mean, what else? I mean, does he have to pull a knife and stab him in his heart to get a 10-8 round out of that round? <laughs> I mean, what, what, what else does he have to do? I mean, how is that not a 10-8 round? There, I mean, did Barbosa maybe landed a kick from his back in desperation, and that is it. I mean, that round was such a 10-8 round. It, I was, I was disgusted. I was really disgusted by it. I'm like, that, that's, that is a 100% draw right there. No, it's like, well, it was close. It, I've seen bullshit. That, that's a 10-8 round. It, you, Barboza did nothing, 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 nothing to deserve a 10-9 round out of that. So. Um, it, it was a draw. I view that fight as a draw. It should have been a draw. Um, now, I'll... For me, for me, Brian, um, round two, it was close to being a 10-8 round for Barbosa. You know, Barbosa really dominated round two. Uh, did you think round two could have possibly been um, a 10-8 round for Barbosa? Obviously, no judge scored it a 10-8 round for him. But I felt it, it was sort of a consolation what helped towards the victory for Barbosa because it was edging on a 10-8 round. No, no, I didn't. Um, it, it was a solid 10-9 round. It, he landed great kicks. He turned up the kicks. It, it was a very clear win. If, if I was using the half-point system, which I keep going back to, it would have been a, a 10-8.5 round versus the first round would have been a 10-8 round. So 
Um, it, it, that one, no. He, he, he outstruck him, got him on the ground. No, it, it was not. I was good with a solid 10-9 round for, for the second round. Uh, Greg, how did you score the first round and the fight between Edson Barboza and Danny Castillo? Same as you guys. Uh, it was a definite 10-8 round. Um, if there was a picture book example of what a 10-8 round is, that was it. Barbosa was getting absolutely battered from pillar to post. Um, Castillo was only so close to finishing the fight um, a couple of times in, within that round. And I just think it was it's crazy that a, a judge can sit and watch that, that one round and think, hmm, he just edged it. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> he, he, he won that round so convincingly, it's, it's crazy. And as for the second round, I thought it was just a 10-9 as well. Barboza did dominate the round, but he never at one point had Castillo in a position where you thought he's going to he's going to win this fight. Whereas in the first round, Castillo had Barboza numerous times at points where you thought this fight's going to finish. Uh, Gregory Sanchez, how did you score round one and the fight between Edson Barboza and Danny Castillo? Yeah, I'd have to agree with you guys. Right before the round was ending, I thought to myself... <laughs> This is like the epitome of a 10-8 round. If there's ever a round you have to look at and tell yourself that's a 10-8 round, it's that round. And uh, towards the end of the fight, I also thought this might be a draw. But uh, I'm just glad both of them got fight of the night bonus. And I'm at least a little bit happy that one judge had the balls to do a (laughs) 10-8. Okay, moving on to round three. Mac Danzig. I'd like to start this round out by discussing Matt Danzig's not-for-sale shorts last night. Uh, I think pretty much everyone else seen them. Apart from Cody McKenzie's wild swimming trunks as well. Wherever <laughs> they were. <laughs> now, apparently Danzig didn't want sponsors for his fight with Joe Laws on because he wanted the fight to be about just him. Uh, what do you make of Matt Danzig opting to have no sponsors, for him? Ah, uh, it's fine. I mean, it's not our place to decide what he wants on his ass. It's, um... He's always been a different different beat. He marches to his own drum type of guy. So, uh, more power to him. It's good for him. Well, one I'm calling bullshit and his reason. Yeah. Um, he was it, no, he trains with Dan Hardy for it, for, for one. Dan Hardy's openly criticised the UFC for their sponsorship uh, tax. Um, Dan's said in the past that fighters are, were used to getting offered, say, $10,000 for getting a name on their on their shorts or two thousand dollars for a name on their poster or whatever. But now they're getting offered a free pair of shorts or a hundred bucks. It's a big difference. They're getting, they're getting nothing. <laughs> and Hardy's been dead against us for a long time. And it's no surprise that Hardy trains with Danzig just now and it was cornering him yesterday. There's more more to that than I wanted the, the fight to be about me. This was more of a protest against we're not going to let you get your name on our shorts or on our banners for sweeties anymore. You're going to have to pay proper money to do it. And I kind of agree with that reasoning, if that's what it is. or It's definitely what it is. But I wish he'd just come out and admit it instead of saying it's all about him. Well, that's a very feasible point there, Greg. I actually didn't know that. That's very interesting. Thank you. Gregory Sanchez, are you surprised that Mac Danzig didn't have sponsors on his trunks last night? Yeah, no, I'm not surprised at all because this actually goes back a couple months. Uh, UFC featherweight Cole Miller uh, had a, a, a pretty long article talking about all these issues just that like Boo brought up about how sponsorships these days, they want to hand you like a 100 bucks to take up most of your shorts. And uh, yeah, times are changing. Just how Dana White addressed it a, a couple of days ago, he said that just the money's not flying in, in like it used to and the economy's bad right now, so... I, I'm not really surprised that uh, a lot of these fighters are just coming out with uh, normal shorts, no sponsors. Uh, well, this was um, Mac Danzig's third straight loss in a row. Do you think he gets cut from the UFC now, Brian? No. I have a certain rule on when you get cut and don't get cut. If you fight on the main card, if you're good enough to be sold as a main card fighter, you don't deserve to get cut unless you do something um, Caleb Starnes like um, so, no, it's getting beat by Joe Lazan is not a bad thing in MMA. It isn't. It, it never will be. He's, he's a good fighter. 
And if you're good enough, again, this is what I always say, if you're good enough to be sold as a main event guy, you're good enough to survive your job not be, uh, with a loss. So I, I, I'll still go back to that. Greg, do you think Matt Danzig gets cut from the UFC? I'm the total opposite. Yes, he gets cut. Partly, that fight wasn't a main card fight initially anyway. That was put, pushed up the card when, I can't remember what fight it was, but another fight fell off the card. Um, Matt Brown, Carlos Condit. That's what it was. So it got pushed up the card. Um, plus, third loss, third loss in the row. And he's lost eight of his last 11 fights. And thirdly, he's on $32,000 a fight, which is more, more than Joe Lozan's on. There's no way he keeps his contract this time. He's gone. He made 32000 without a win bonus last night. Yeah. He's, so a, he didn't have fucking he's a seriously well-paid lightweight. He's, he's gone. He didn't need the sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> Should have just said that. That's the reason. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Gregory Sanchez, do you see him getting cut from the USC? Honestly, I do, but he's on a three-fight losing streak right now. But if you guys recall his Gomi loss, Dana Wyatt actually went on Twitter and said he thought Dadzik won. And then after that, he got knocked out by Gallard and lost his lows on. But I'm seeing he's going to get cut. That's what I'm seeing. But I wouldn't be surprised if they tried to sign him to like a um, lesser contract. Okay, moving on to the fight itself. Me and uh, Greg probably started this conversation a little early. <laughs> Just a bit. <laughs> what did you make of the fight between Mac Danzig and Joe Laws on last night, Brian? Um, I, I agree with uh, with Blue on this one. Mac was really owning it standing. He was looking really good standing. Joe did not have anything for him on the feet. But once it went to the ground, it was completely different. As much... As much better as Mac was standing, Joe was slightly better than that on the ground. It was it was a fun fight, and um, it kind of what I expected. I'm always rooting for Mac just because he's a different different guy out there. I'm not sure why. I don't know if it's him letting a damn fly out when he was on tough versus killing the fly. He's just 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 a weird cat, and uh, I always kind of support people like that a little bit, not being the status quo type of guy. So. Uh, but it's hard to root against Joe. Joe's such a likable guy, too. So I enjoyed the fight. Um, judges got it right, and it was uh, it was pretty pretty good way to to kind of start the, the night out for the main cards. Greg, anything else you would like to mention on the boat between Mac Danzig and Joe Lawson? Yeah, touched most of it already when we were jumping into the wrong bit. But <laughs> uh, Lawson definitely won the fight, and that was a straightforward win in the end. I just thought... Uh, Danzig missed an opportunity by uh, taking the fight to the ground when he didn't need to. But yeah, other than that, much the same as what I said already. Same question for you, Gregory Sanchez. What did you make of the fight last night between Mac Danzig and Joe Lozon? Well, yeah, a decisive win for uh, Lozon for sure. But after his uh, his post fight interviews, he he tells multiple people that he swears Danzig popped his arm. He popped Danzig. Danzig's arm uh, multiple times so I think the whole grappling with Danzig maybe his his arm was hurt you know okay moving on to round four Uriah Faber versus Michael McDonald now this one seemed to start off with Faber playing safe and getting a, a round under his belt that's what it seems to me anyway things took a vicious turn in round two as Faber rocked McDonald and followed him down to the ground to lock in the guillotine choke for the submission victory what did you make of the fight between Michael McDonald and Uriah Faber? More importantly, what did you make of Faber's performance, Brian? Um, well, I've, I've been noted of not being a huge Faber fan. Um, but I'm a huge, huge uh, Bang fan. So him being coach over there is turning the tides as far as me and that whole camp. But Faber fought smart. He, he doesn't do the the reckless shit that he made him famous essentially, but got his ass knocked out by Brown too. So he still has the movement. He still has the quickness and the aggressiveness and the power, but he's not, he's not doing it so flashy. He's not trying to look good being while he's fighting. And that's what I didn't like about him before is he, he's trying to look good. You could see this guy 
he's a guy that boxes in a mirror a lot to watch himself. And that's probably why I'm not a fan of him so much because he wants to <laughs> look good. I'm serious. He, he wants to look good. Not to impress people, he wants to look good. There, there's a little video out there of, uh, of Dana kind of spying on Faber when he's outside. Yeah, he's looking that. at himself and yeah, he's looking at himself in the reflection of a building. Yeah, yeah, that's one hundred percent the guy. Boxing. Yes, yes, and he's <laughs> flexing and posing. That that is Faber, and that's why I'm not a huge fan of the guy. But last night it was fucking impressive. That was a great win, great showing, no flashy shit, movement to do proper movement, uh, just balls to the wall. I really enjoyed the fight, and that was. That's as impressed with Faber as I've ever been. Brian, you know Faber is one of these guys who has a bigger wardrobe than a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> Greg, what did you make of the fight between Faber and McDonald, and more importantly, Faber's performance? Yeah, well, obviously, when we did the last show, I thought he would be the fighter of the night, and I still think he was fighter of the night. Um, he was... Impressive, uh, right f- right from the get go, he took McDonald down right away. So to stop McDonald getting any rhythm in the fight at all, um, and from there on, he just dictated the whole pace of the fight. I thought McDonald would have had an advantage in the striking, but I thought Faber was out striking him, out moving him. He did everything right. Uh, caught him with a couple of good shots, and eventually finished the fight. Um, McDonald's easily the the toughest fight he's had outside of a title fight and he made it look easy. Gregory Sanchez, what did you make of the fight between Faber and McDonald last night and Faber's performance? Yeah, I thought it was amazing. I think he just straight out schooled McDonald. And uh, But you kind of expect this out of a Faber when it's a non-title bout. I think we're all waiting for the moment where he does this to Burrell, Cruz, or whoever the champion is. I think that's going to be the day when Everybody in the MMA community says, wow, this guy's fucking legit. Everyone's saying that now, but as a championship caliber fighter. Okay, moving on to our fifth and final round. Demetrius Johnson versus Joseph Benavidez. Now, this was billed as a tight affair and a 60-40 matchup. In the end, it was anything but as Demetrius Johnson finished Joseph Benavidez via brutal knockout, followed by some ground and pound. Brian, what did you make of the main event and Demetrius Johnson's performance? I'm a huge Mighty Mouse nut hugger. Um, I, I have no problems admitting the fighters I don't like, like Faber and uh, guys I love, like like Mighty Mouse. He's he's the first little guy that I just grabbed on and, God, I'd probably weigh him down pretty quickly, but just kind of just held on and just became a huge fan of him. And he's he's not letting me down. He's evolving. He's growing. He's He's becoming a better fighter with every fight and that that's why I love to see these guys. It's it's such a evolving sport. We know that the fighters in the next decade are gonna be a lot better than the fighters this decade, which are a lot better than the fighters from past decade. It's such a evolving sport, such a baby sport. And you get to see the growth. It's kinda of like seeing these guys on tough and you see them a couple of years later as as they continue to grow. I just huge freaking fan of the guy and um, what, what else can you say about him? Uh, sub last fight and a KO this fight. I mean, just, oh, he doesn't finish people. Well, yeah, he does now. So now, now what are you going to bitch about? So I love it. Absolutely loved it. Well, I'm going to see into the future in a minute. Um, I think it involves Brad Pickett somewhere. Greg, <laughs> same question for you there. <laughs> uh, yeah, Mighty Mouse was brilliant last night. Um, that's two two wins he's had in a row and two finishes and he's criticised for no finishing fights so he's doing what he can to win people over. Uh, Benavidez was been tipped by many to to win that fight last night. He he looked really good in his fights since he lost to Mighty Mouse and he had the KO power apparently but he was the the one who was on the end of it and <clears throat> like you say. It's probably favoured my guy for the the next title shot, Brad there Pickett. If Pickett if Pickett beats McCall now, it's an easy fight to make because they can bill it as the rematch. Pickett was the last that beat beat him already. I think uh, they'll fast track Pickett to the next title shot if he beats McCall. 
Yeah, I believe so too. It certainly makes sense. Uh, Gregory Sanchez, what did you make of the main event last night and Demetrius Johnson's performance? Yeah, I mean, you definitely saw Benavides try to go in there a bit more calmer. He seemed like he was taking his time. Uh, but honestly, I think that was a mistake because you saw Mighty Mouse, he was measuring his time, his timing, and he was he was waiting for the right opportunity. And uh, wow, he just showed that he's here, he's there to stay in the flyweight division. And yeah, I think you're right about Pickett because they're going to fast. They're, they're, it seems like McCall's on his way back up after winning two, I think. And uh, yeah, if Pickett, if Pickett wins that fight, that's the next fight. Unfortunately, we would already be talking about another contender coming up with John Lineker, but he can't make weight. Missed it three <laughs> times. He's with Dolce now, so apparently things are looking good there. John Lineker's an absolute stud. But you know, if you look at um, Brad Pickett and Ian McCall, they're so similar, in my opinion. I think, you know, Brad Pickett, when he first started out, he had a, you know, sort of, I wouldn't say awful growing game, but it was, you know, not his best part of his game, that's for sure. If you watch his early fights and the early cage rages, you know, his growing game was a bit suspect. But he, he improved really, really quick. He's always had the hands, but he just really reminds me of Ian McCall. You know, both just bring this intense boxing style non-stop, set up nice angles, moving out really quick. That, that's a pick and fight for me. That really is. That could spoil Brad Pickett versus Demetrius Johnson, to be honest with you. But either way, it's going to be a rematch. The only good thing about Pickett, though, is Demetrius Johnson gets to avenge the loss. You know, it's the champion gets to avenge the loss, you know. That's the best thing about Pickett coming forward. But, you know, Ian McCall had two fucking fantastic scraps in my way. The first one was awesome. I really enjoyed that first fight. You was going to say something there, Greg? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The, the, the difference is the, the Johnson's got the chance to avenge the loss. That's the easy way to sell that one but like you say the the third fight between McCall and, and Mighty Mouse would be good as well sure. it's a good good angle as well sadly that's a wrap for today's show as always thank you for watching and please keep up the support for our shows it is greatly appreciated thank you very much